This is Dr. Jerome Corsi. Uh, today it's Wednesday, it's January 3rd, 2024. Uh, follow us on Twitter at, at Corsi Jerome number one. That's all small letters, low, lower letters, and the number one. So C O R S I J E R O M E, Corsi Jerome one, at Corsi Jerome one on Twitter. I'm posting a lot on Twitter now. Again, I'm getting, as I said, I, for a while there, I thought I'd be retired, but. That has changed. I'm back fully now. I actually did a um, three-hour speak yesterday on Twitter, now X, and uh, it was with Brad Miller, who has done a petition. And he's military. He was drummed out of the military because he would not take the vaccinations. So on militaryaccountability.com, he has a petition that you can sign, which is a petition to... Uh, have the military respect our individual human rights not to be forced to take vaccines that we object to. And again, I think it's very important, militaryaccountability.com, and we will be posting on thetruthcentral.com the three-hour speak we did yesterday on Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024, on X or Twitter. Uh, stories we're covering today. Uh, first, I want to cover a um, editorial that showed up in this um, Real Clear Wire, and it was about Trump. Like it or not, 2024 is the year of Trump. Is this editorial, and uh, I, I think it's probably true. It's by Frank Miele, M-I-E-L-E, Miel, and uh, what the facts are is that the primaries again it's just two weeks from now we have the iowa caucuses at the end of the month new hampshire voters are going to be uh deciding what they want to do for their for their nomination their primary is going to be held primaries of course are to commit the state delegates to the uh, republican national nominating committee convention that's held later in the year probably around august in order to determine who's the presidential candidate. Now, the reality is that Donald Trump is just dominating the field. In fact, he's been so dominant that I've hardly followed the primaries. Again, I didn't watch any of the debates of these candidates. I thought it was absolutely irrelevant what Chris Christie said. And the big deal is, you know, that's being covered, which seems to me to be really inconsequential is which of these other people have any chance at all, and I don't think any of them do. I mean, Nikki Haley is the one they're saying is number two, and she's, of course, liked by the media, but uh, she does not have a very strong following among true conservatives, which means that among the Trump mega group, she is not particularly popular. So I don't think she has any staying power even with the traditional GOP establishment, which, of course, would not like to have Trump again be their candidate. DeSantis uh, could collapse in Iowa, and if he does, if he doesn't win in Iowa, you're going to at least come in number two. I think uh, Trump, even now, though he's not in the caucuses, will probably do well in all the primaries. He's not running any of the primaries, but I don't think it makes any difference. I think the GOP voters not the GOP establishment, which is, again, these parties do not represent voters any longer. The Democratic Party has become a neo-Marxist party, become a communist party. And uh, that's this book I've written, which is now uh, doing very well. It's called The The Truth About Neo-Marxism, this book right here, Cultural Maoism and Anarchy. Uh, I encourage you to read it. I mean, if you really want to understand how this woke nonsense, this woke insanity has come about, you've got to understand the political theory, political philosophy of how it's developed. And this book shows you that, that this is a combination of neo-Marxism attacking the culture, not an economic analysis like Marx originally intended. The original Marx failed. 
This is a reinterpretation of Marx through thinkers like Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian communist between the wars, World War I and World War II, and then modified by Mao, who ran a cultural Maoism. They had a cultural revolution in China, which about destroyed all the traditional values in culture, all the tradition, all the, all the Confucianism, all the learning, all the history, very much like is going on right now in the United States, taking down statues, uh, having this insanity in the universities, which we'll cover just in a little bit. Uh, and it leads to anarchy. And we are headed to anarchy. That's where we're headed right now with our cities being hell holes, democratic run hell holes, defund the police. So you've got crime rampant in the cities, homelessness, bankruptcy of the cities, uh, vacancies in the office buildings. We're already in a dystopian world, although it's hard to recognize because, again, America is a very big and robust country, very diverse, and the American people are not woke. They're not buying this nonsense. They're not buying the gender confusion. And Donald Trump can run for president even if he is convicted of one of these crimes. Now, it looks like the only real trial that's going to occur is the one in New York because all these other trials have been postponed by motions and various other delaying tactics. But the uh, Trump will probably, these charges, even CNN has admitted that the case against Trump in New York is very weak. This is the whole idea that New York is the this vague legal theory that he hid payments to the porn star Stormy Daniels that were paid through his attorney, Michael Cohen. And of course, Michael Cohen has turned against Trump. He was uh, convicted of crimes and put in prison for a while, then released on home confinement. Uh, but again, Cohen has written books. He's a, a trashed Trump. And uh, that part it was part of his deal, I'm sure. And Trump did not really support Michael Cohen after he was indicted. So CNN published an editorial calling the case weak. And I, I think that this New York... District Attorney Alvin Bragg has just had clearly a, a vendetta, a hatred for Trump. And that's what all these Jack Smith, the you know the federal special prosecutor going after Donald Trump, all these things are only increasing his popularity. They are not detracting from Donald Trump's popularity. And Donald Trump just dominates all candidates at the moment. Biden's polls are so weak that they won't tell you the truth about them. And Biden is obviously undergoing senior dementia, and it's hard to know how anyone could support someone for president who is as incapacitated as Biden appears to be. It's just ridiculous. Obviously, he's not the power behind the throne. He's not. He's, he's sitting on the throne, and you know, probably we have not had such a demented monarch since George the Third and the Revolutionary War times in London. This it, it's pretty disgraceful when you think about it. And that's happening in the United States of America is amazing the extent to which our country is already deteriorated in terms of political values, that we have someone in the White House who's obviously corrupt, and the Congress, which itself is corrupt, the amount of money being spent, the amount of money being bought, you know, it's easy to buy politicians. China spent relatively little money compared to running a war to buy the entire White House and much of the Congress. Mitch McConnell is married to a Chinese woman, Elaine Chow, who was Secretary of Transportation for a while. And her family is wealthy in China. And I guarantee you, uh, if Mitch McConnell was not doing the bidding of China, that family wouldn't be alive. That's how China operates. And so we are now in a very strange period of time, which looks to me almost as if the you know powers of Satan are having a field day because they're out there godless, out there demanding that we have all these woke values in our media. Our media obviously is not doing the reporting that it should be done. And again, the American people are out there saying, what can we do? Well, what we can do is we can protest, we can write about it, we can talk about it, we can vote on it. These are things that are completely legitimate to do. Under the First Amendment, we have a, you know, we cannot, this whole censorship is a complete violation of the First Amendment, and it should not be going on. Now, I want to cover a couple more stories 
and then I want to um, have Chris comment. Uh, I'm going to com- com- do two stories on the economy. Uh, first, the U.S. debt has now hit, it just hit the $34 trillion mark of our national debt. First time ever. Okay, and we're about 120% the debt ratio to our GDP. And, you know, the <clears throat> U.S. debt uh, in 2000, January 2009 was $10.6 trillion. Now, I mean, that's that's a remarkable short period of time to have the debt more than triple. And the rate at which the debt is increasing is is uh, getting faster. It's exponentially growing faster. So, for instance, we had $1 trillion added to the debt in the past three months, $2 trillion in the last six months, $4 trillion in the past two years, and $11 trillion in the past four years. That's an exponential pic- picture. What it's going to mean is it's going to take us less than three months, maybe a month and a half, to add another trillion dollars to the national debt. And when you see how the rate, the, the ratios are going, in the third quarter, the economy, our gross domestic product and the private economy, grew a, a total of 340, let me get the figure right, $547 billion. But the budget deficit increased $621 billion. Now, if our budget deficit is growing faster than the GDP, we're in deep trouble. And what it means is that a lot of the growth in the GDP is stimulated by the money being spent that's simply printed, fiat currency. Okay, so the Treasury prints the money, Federal Reserve. Is, we're, we're, we're essentially, you know, paying interest on our own money from the Federal Reserve, and the, and at this rate, we're paying over a trillion dollars a year simply to pay the interest on the outstanding Treasury bonds that have been sold to finance the debt. This is not sustainable. They talk about sustainable you know, when the UN wanting to cut down our living standards and make us eat bugs, that's sustainable. Well, this is not sustainable. And what it's going to mean is an historic gold rise. And we're going to get to that in a second, but this, I'm astounded today by the number of different predictions that are coming out at the beginning of the year for exactly what we've been saying throughout 2023 was going to happen, which is an historic gold rise. So there's a story today in the Epic Times saying that the U.S. Fed rate cuts elevated central bank gold buying, which has gone on across the world and has a little bit noticed. So there are predictions that gold is going to hit $2,300 an ounce by the end of the year. So in 2023, gold prices jumped from around $1,823 per ounce to $2,062 an ounce, which is an increase of 13%. Uh, everyone listened to what we were saying last year. Instead of your money, your dollars, purchasing power deteriorating, had you put some money in gold, you would have seen a 13% increase in the value of your holdings in terms of gold. Remember, you can sell the gold. You can sell the gold and get the value that's increased. You can hold on to the gold, and it's going to go much higher. Okay, so J.P. Morgan is predicting gold to have a breakout rally starting in the middle of the year due to the Federal Reserve's interest rate cuts. Uh, and the Fed, Fed, J.P. Morgan expects gold to hit $2,300 an ounce. And, and UBS is predicting gold to hit $2,150 by the end of this year if rate cuts were to take place. So what we're seeing across the board is a realization, you know, that the World Gold Council update, central banks collectively brought an astonishing 800 tons of gold in the first three quarters of 2023, 14% increase in gold buying compared with the same period last year. A survey, May 30th survey published by 
this World Gold Council found that the majority of central banks expect the proportion of their total reserves dominated in gold to increase over the next five years, thus contributing to upside pressure on gold prices. Uh, gold today is trading at, I believe, $2,053 an ounce, and it's now holding above $2,000 an ounce. Okay, this leads us to our major sponsor, which is uh, uh, Swiss America. And I'm going to pull the book here, Swiss America. I published a book with Dean Heskin, who is the CEO of Swiss America. It's called How the Coming Global Crash Will Create an Historic Gold Rush. Uh, you can get this book free by calling Swiss America. The toll-free number is 1-800-519-519. I'm going to repeat that. 1-800-519-6268. Write it down. 1-800-519-6268. Get a copy of this book. I go through explaining how in the past when we've gone through energy crises in the 70s, credit crises 2008-2009, gold doubled each time. And I think what we're going through in terms of the coming gold, global crash is going to possibly double gold over the next few years. What I write about in this book is showing you how the economics of the oil markets have affected dramatically the uh, whether or not we go into a recession. Because again, without cheap energy, and this green energy is intended to diminish the economic prowess of the United States. It's, a, it's an, another neo-Marxist plan. And I have argued in this book, in many books, that uh, this whole global warming, climate change is a hoax. It's just not true and scientifically. So uh, gold will probably, again, continue this rise. And to, if you've got your money in the stock market, don't rely on it just going up all the time. The stock market does not always just increase. The stock market has fluctuations, and right now it's positioned for a massive correction downward. Again, the price earnings relationships are showing inflated values simply because the amount of money the government continues to pump into the economy. These wars we're having have caused the next great bonanza for the arms manufacturers and the arms dealers in the United States. Wars are profitable. That's the problem with wars. Wars get caused to be profitable. As insane as that seems, that's one of the major motivations the military has for going to war. Of course, you know, the military not fighting a war, sitting around in peacetime, uh, it languishes. In wartime, there's lots of money, lots of arms being manufactured and used, and lots of future big jobs for the generals when they retire for the military to go into the arms manufacturing industry as executives and sell the weapons back to the government. So, same with the pharmaceutical companies, with the pandemic. Pandemic was great for the pharmaceutical companies, not particularly great for the human beings that suffered the disease or the vaccines. These are problems that we've got. And the money behind this, the money behind the corruption, the Biden corruption, combined with this wokeness, where the Department of Justice will do nothing unless it's against Trump, the Department of Justice has largely abandoned its mission to control crime and to go into its counterinsurgency mission, which it started, ramped up during the Russian collusion hoax, come after Donald Trump, is now become a domestic policing of political conservatives. Anything woke is okay. You know, the, uh, during the Black Lives Matters rioting in Washington, D.C., when they're trying to burn down St. John's Episcopal Church outside the White House. The um, FBI was taking a knee to Black Lives Matter. Donald Trump was ridiculed, and uh, the press attacked him viciously because he dared hold a Bible outside that church and say that this was a disgrace to be burning down that church. Trump got accused of stimulating a riot that night. This is insanity. And it is upside down. It's a fundamental perversion of language. By the way, also, I've started a, a substack, and we're going to put that up on the website again increasingly. The substack is 
uh, it again, Jerome Corsi PhD dot Substack. Just look for my name, Jerome Corsi PhD, all together, all small letters. That's my Substack, and I'm going to be posting a great deal of material on that in the next few months. I've already started excerpts from books. I'm going to be covering energy. I'm going to be covering the neo Marxism, uh, the economics topics I generally cover, and we're going to start doing more interviews on this show. Uh, Chris, would you like to comment on what we've covered so far? Oh, yes. As we saw, Bidenomics back in action for 2024. The man's going to run on this, too. The man is going to go around the country and, and run on what he calls Bidenomics, which is a clear failure. It's, it's, raising, the debt in the, uh, it's raising the U.S. debt at the astronomical rate you just reported. And, it's, and the sycophants are going to be out there posting on social media. They have already how proud they are of their president and his economic plan. And this, this is going to brainwash some people who really aren't paying attention. They're going to see slightly lowered food prices from last year and the year before and slightly lowered gas prices. They're going to think, wow, this is much better than what we had two years ago at the Bidenomics peaks. They're not going to associate it. And this is going to, again, kind of manipulate at least part of the electorate for November. Well, you're going to have a whole series of attempts to prop up the economy and to keep things going at a high level, printing more money and postponing the crash and pushing it out into 2025 in order to have the Democrats not simply get crushed across the board during the November elections. And the Democrats are very worried about this. They understand that they have to make things look good. Uh, when 2020 came around, Trump was president. We had a whole series. We had you know, the Antifa riots in Portland, Oregon. We had the Black Lives Matters riots after George Floyd. Oh, wait, wait. Those were mostly peaceful protests. Don't, don't you know that? Uh, right. Yeah. And, and today, I believe that uh, Biden is going to play somewhere near Valley Forge to give a, a speech saying that Trump is the greatest threat we've ever had to democracy. Now, when the Democrats talk about democracy, they don't mean democracy. They mean they mean social democracy. Right. They mean they the mean, world. Yeah. They mean Agenda 2030, if you will. Agenda 2030, and also the social justice of the woke movement. In other words, we're racist. Everything is racist. We've got to eliminate racism. You know, white people have to be negated. It's That's actually horrible. Yeah. Very, <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it, well, it's, a, it's a very intense. It's a very intense anti. It's very, they intensify the use of race right. in order to demonize um, white people and claim the United States is a racist nation. That's the whole agenda. Well, that's, that's how they rewrote history, by the way, as and, the, the colonizers are the evil white people, of course, and they, they oppress all the, all the noble people from around the world that aren't white. And all of a sudden you have the mentality that uh, causes the anti-Semitism we have after the October 7th attacks. Well, let's cover a couple of stories on the wars going on, and then we'll cover Harvard University. Uh, there was a major escalation in the Middle East as the uh, Israelis attacked in Lebanon, one of these Hamas leaders, and uh, it, was, it was a attack that eliminated him. And again, this is, Hezbollah is the ruling terrorist party in Lebanon, backed by Iran, and this um, this leader whom they uh, they assassinated, uh, I guess probably in a drone attack, I would guess. Although again, I'm I'm trying to get the details of details are just really emerging in the press right now. But his name was uh, El Aruri, A R O U R I. He lived in Beirut. He was 57 years old. He'd been a senior political leader for Hamas and had done a lot in Qatar and other places, pulling together the radical groups in, in Qatar, Qatar, Q-A-T-A-R. Uh, there are a lot of Hamas leaders living, even though Hamas's strength is in Palestine, with their Palestinian movement in the Gaza Strip. Gaza is a narrow piece of land which is on the Mediterranean, just north of Egypt in Israel. And Israel is pulled out of Gaza and allowed Hamas to control before it was the Palestinian Authority that controlled. 
But increasingly, Hamas has taken over the Palestinian Authority, and the Palestinian Liberation Organizations have all collapsed into Hamas. These were extremely radical movements, and their purpose, funded by Iran, is to kill Jews and destroy the state of Israel. They do not want the Jewish state of Israel to exist. And that was seen in this horrendous October 7th attack. Now, on our universities, Hamas has been celebrated. Hamas demonstrations have been held around the world. And again, this anti-Americanism is now embraced the radical Islamic movements, which are fundamentally based in terrorism. Because again, the you know enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so therefore, Hamas hates America. The generation we're raising in the universities hates America. They've been in the, you know, the ideologically brainwashed to hate America. And so therefore, you see the union between the radical Islamic movement and the extreme left neo-Marxist cultural Maoist left in America. And it is a hate America movement. Now, what's going on here threatens to expand the war because now Lebanon has had a Hamas leader killed. Hezbollah, which has been shelling Israel, north, uh, Lebanon's into the north of Israel. And Syria, which is to the kind of northwest of Israel, I'm sorry, northeast of Israel, you can you can stand in the Golan Heights, the north and northern part of Israel, and look down and see Damascus. I've done it. I've been there. And Israel's got now essentially a three front war because they're being shelled by the remnants of ISIS in Syria, by Hezbollah in Lebanon, and they're fighting against Hamas in Gaza. Now, yesterday, Israel intensified the attacks in central and southern um, Gaza in order to root out Hamas. And they are, Israel, this is the most vicious attack from Israel, most determined attack. I say vicious, I mean, it, it's determined. They are, they're not stopping. They're not listening to the world crying for the civilians being killed and uh, Israel's instead broadcasting how Hamas has tradition, traditionally operated out of the hospitals and used civilians as shields to, and then gone to the public's world and said, look, look how many civilians are being killed. Uh, the Biden administration's behind the scenes have been trying to get Israel to stop this incursion into Gaza. I, I don't think Israel's going to stop until they've completely destroyed Hamas. Uh, also, Gaza is being depopulated. About 70% of all the buildings in, in, in Gaza have been destroyed one way or the other. And the po population's largely fled. So you have a depopulation going on in the Gaza. And I don't know what Israel's going to do to replace that population, whether they're going to let the Palestinians back in or not. Uh, I don't think Israel's going to abandon control of Gaza like it did before. I think Israel's taking over Gaza, and I don't think it's going to be relinquished. That's going to be a fundamental change. That's going to be intensify the determination of the radical Islamic movement to attack Israel, and we're only getting into an escalation of this war. It's increasingly looking like the beginning of World War III, when our military could is more worried about holding a transgender parade. We've got the DEI initiatives, diversity, equity, and inclusion are more important to the military than being able to fight a war. We abandoned all the military equipment we left behind in Afghanistan. It was a disaster. That's the way our military operates these days. You know, we've got soldier men in the army running around dressed as women. I mean, this is this insanity in an army is destructive. You can't have gender in, insecurity or gender, you know, confusion in a military force. It's, it's not particularly the way to run a military. And given this, you're finding that we are at a, it, it, probably the most vulnerable position militarily that we've been in since the end of World War II. So the violence is intensifying in Gaza and the war is expanding into, uh, into Lebanon and into Syria with 
Iran at the helm. Now, if we switch to Ukraine, what we're finding is the Ukraine also had, um, is also intensifying. Russia over the holidays bombarded Ke Kiev, or they say Kev these days, bombarded Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, with hundreds of missiles. Uh, and it was probably the most vicious attack on the northern cities. So what you find that Russia, which is solidly in control of the eastern part of Ukraine, which is traditionally Russian-oriented, and is expanding into the southern part, which is also controlled by Russia, along the Black Sea, with the exception maybe of Odessa. So you have Russia in firm control. They're not going to be dislodged. And what is Zelensky doing? He's now shelling uh, Russian cities, Russian region, uh, the Belgorod region, with missiles. He said missile and drone attacks, uh, 13, 12 missiles and several dozen drones in the early hours of Wednesday today in Russia's southern region of Belogord. So Russia's defense ministries announced this, and Ukraine bringing the war to Russia is a very, very bad idea because what it will do is it'll stimulate among the Russians a desire to attack and to reduce the power here in Ukraine. I see the sunshade should have been adjusted here. I've got the uh, sun coming in, so I apologize for kind of the uh, pattern here of the sun on my face. It did, well, I just did not close the blinds. This time of year, the sun comes in directly into my study and I could always measure here the winter by the progression of the sun. Uh, we are past the equinox. We're, past, we're now headed towards longer days. And the uh, and also, I think probably, at least if the predictions are right, we're going to have some more severe weather in January than we've had so far in the winter. Uh, it's not global warming. It is a combination of the uh, El Nino currents, which are now dominating in the Pacific Ocean. That's a much larger force than a little bit more carbon dioxide in the year, Earth's atmosphere. I'm uh, going to cover one more story and then before we quit. But Chris, would you like to comment on these wars, et cetera? And I'll close the blinds here for a minute while you do. <laughs> uh, what can I say more than what's been said already? These wars have, uh, have been expensive to say the least. We know at this point that, uh, that the October 7th attacks must be retaliated against. And we do have to help out Israel, but the conduct of the West has been abhorrent. When it, when it came to Ukraine, everybody had to rally around Ukraine because there was a common enemy involved, or as uh, as Kamala Harris put it, a bigger nation attacked a smaller nation, though that nation was enemy number one around, I guess, 20, 2016, 2017, 2018. But that's another story for a different time. You work at the you look at the conduct of the Western those same Western nations today and the United Nations trying to dictate how the war is going to go, trying to dictate what happens afterward, as if Benjamin Netanyahu is going to follow their orders after having to deal with national security issues following this kind of war. That's absolutely ridiculous. It's it's. It's something that's going to be interesting to watch in 2024. It's going to be interesting to see how the uh, Israeli people react in the next election after all this goes down. And it's going to be interesting to see. Look, the fact is Netanyahu gave these guys a chance. They gave Gaza and Hamas a chance to uh, coexist with each other. It didn't happen. And guess what? Things go back to normal. The, the two-state solution happens on both sides. It is going to happen again. Hamas has said it already. Well, there, there's never going to be a two-state solution because the uh, Palestinians will just view that as a temporary condition before they eliminate Israel, just gain oh, more power. John Quincy Adams knew that a long time ago. Yeah, that's true. By the way, our other sponsor, I just remembered seeing, you know, uh, My Vital C, and I've written this book with Chris Burries. We're going to be promoting this a lot more in 2024, uh, Live Longer and Better. It's about My Vital C, which is a, uh, a molecule that was discovered really about 40 years ago. It has uh, 60 carbon atoms in a cage structure, like a soccer ball around the nucleus. And uh, it's called a fullerene after Buckminster Fuller. These are fullerenes. They're very, very interesting molecules. 
And my vital C, which comes in olive oil or other avocado oil or coconut oil, I like the olive oil myself. Uh, I've been taking it for four years. I'm just reminded, you know, my hair colors come back into my hair and I more vitality. I'm 77 years old and probably more active than I've ever been. I do solidly recommend you try my vital C. And we're going to be doing a lot more promotion of this and we'll be doing some special interviews. I'm going to do a lot more interviews in the health field in 2024. Um, okay, so the hair growth products, uh, there's also creams and lotions, as well as this soluble carbon 60 in olive oil. If you go to right up just our sponsors and you pull down Swiss, Swiss America for the, for the book offer and gold, if you pull down My Vital C, these are our sponsors. And I, if you like the show, please do take a look at our sponsors. That will help us greatly. Uh, the final story I want to cover today is this, this um, Claudine uh, Gay, who was president of Harvard, and she resigned yesterday under great pressure because what she has done is plagiarized just about everything she's written. And also her testimony... Uh, before Congress, when she really did not take a strong uh, position against Hamas, have raised concerns about anti-Semitism on the Harvard campus. Now, this is an important story, uh, not because this fraud, Claudine Gay, did not follow the rules, academic rules. You can't, you can't have president of Harvard who uh, plagiarized her dissertation. It's just a disgrace. And uh, Yes, it's in the best interest of Harvard that she never be at Harvard if that's the kind of behavior she exhibited in her academic career. So the plagiarism is rampant. It's been not only in her dissertation, but it's been noted at other places. Again, she was a DEI president, and the left doesn't care about truth. The left doesn't think there is truth. It's a modern movement that's, you know, like Baud really are, this nutty, a postmodernist French writer who said that the, there is no reality. Everything is just a simulacrum. It's just all word games. It's all made up. It's our constructs. So if that's the case, why don't we have constructs that are utopian? Let's, let's imagine no borders. Let's imagine no police. Let's imagine no Bud really hard. That'd be a lot more sane. Instead, we're, 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 uh, we're celebrating schizophrenia. Whatever these people believe, what what is your gender? My gender is of a of a, a gay duck from the 1400s in China. Okay, now if that isn't insane, you know you need to see a psychiatrist. You know, if you think you're a gay duck from 1400s in China, good luck. And if that's what you're going to be taught at Harvard, what are you going to do with that? You know, how is that a job? No, it's dumbing down America, getting a uh, a mind virus which is like a malware of the brain where you these people can't do anything except feel that they've suffered a microaggression because you've used the wrong pronoun to describe them i mean this is this is insanity so you get a group of um conservatives here and they are demanding see first of all the idea that these schools are going to be anti-semitic is a bad idea given the support the Jewish community, which has always valued education, has given to Harvard and other universities. So Harvard alum, Bill Ackman, who is an investor, a billionaire investor, he is one of the earliest critics of gay and how and critics of how the university handled uh, the October 7th Hamas attack. So he was celebrating that uh, gay is gone. Okay, and and quite frankly, I'm happy she's gone too. This is a disgrace to Harvard. Uh, ap early application admissions for early applications to Harvard have fallen 17 percent. And again, uh, Facebook groups are saying, you know, are Jewish students going to be? Uh, are they going to be safe on campus in Harvard? That's a good question. So the Harvard Corporation, created in 1650 which has fiduciary responsibility for the school, now has to oversee the process of finding a new president. So Gay was Harvard's 
first black president and second woman president after only a five month search, which is the shortest search in 70 years, according to the Harvard Crimson. Okay, now she was there because of her DEI credentials, certainly not her academic credentials, which have now been completely undercut. Now, this is a concern across the Ivy League and across universities in America. Even the Supreme Court decision has now stated that the you can't utilize race as a admissions preference. Uh, that was a, a major decision in the Supreme Court. And again, uh, it was a decision that was reached, a six to three decision, uh, forces a rework, it forced a reworking of the admissions criteria in higher education. And Chief Justice John Roberts, who finally did something worthwhile, set new parameters for the debate over the what the criteria should be uh, in this case in which he said too long for too long universities have concluded wrongly <clears throat> the touchstone of individuals identity is not uh, built on their educational ability their intellectual qualities but the color of their skin and he Roberts finally said that that cannot be a criteria for determining admission on a preference basis. Okay, now this is a fundamental change. What we've got the woke so intensifying race, so in, so weaponizing race that you know that's the you know okay so DEI we have to get one of this color, one of that color, one of this color, one of this gender, one of that gender you know, one of whatever else our inclusion criteria are, one of this faith, one of that faith, one of no faith, one that worships Satan, one that worships Jesus Christ, one that worships themselves, one that worships the cat, one that worships nothing or stones or whatever they choose to worship. This is insanity because that mix can never be satisfied given the potential to, as soon as you eliminate duality in thinking, in other words, you know, you have duality, good, bad. Say, well, wait a minute, that's just your preference for good, bad. So there is no real objective standard of good, bad. Well, that's nonsense. You know, so these people decide, well, I'm going to cut a hole in the bottom of my boat because I want to see the fish. Your boat's going to sink. There are fundamental laws of how this place works. And this insanity is designed to be destructive. It's designed through hundreds of years of working on the malware that once you get it in people's heads, they can't function. They just destroy. And we're right now in a cycle of destruction. Any final comments, Chris, then we're going to wrap up. Well, there's one more thing when it comes to Claudine Gay, and that is that she's not leaving Harvard, uh, as a matter of fact. And this is probably another, this probably has a little more to do with the DEI aspect as well. She is retaining a position as, um, as a member of the faculty. Yeah, right. So that's that's yeah. what, uh, this is according to Fox Business, Al Jazeera, and other reports. The uh, fact is, she is not gone from Harvard. She is still there, and her ilk is still poisoning that particular university and many others. This is a huger problem than just one person, because once when we expose a few, they're not going to go away. They, these people actually think they're self-righteous enough to double down on this later on, maybe protect some of their own as they've done, and then move forward. Aren't these the people that hired Brian Stelter? Maybe I'm wrong. Aren't these the people that hired Brian Stelter to lecture or something like that? Yes. I mean, the yes, the double down is the point in point. I want to focus on that for a minute because the climate movement is going to do the same. They got defeated at this, this recent climate conference in Dubai because Al Gore and the others wanted to have a agreement coming out, a statement coming out that we were going to end the use of fossil fuels. And that's just not possible, not unless we want to kill billions of people. And in fact, that's the agenda. Bill Gates, the World Economic Forum, these people are openly saying the world would be better off if we didn't have so many billions of people on the planet. And so therefore, the death agenda is one that is being openly proclaimed by uh, w World Economic Forums, like this guy Harari, 
and we'll be covering him more this year too. I'm going to try to start writing the third book on this Great Awakening trilogy. First two are The Truth About Energy, Global Warming, and Climate Change. The second, which is now out, Truth About Neo-Marxism, Cultural Maoism, and Anarchy. And the third book will be about transhumanism. And it'll be The Great Awakening, Volume 3. And it'll be the truth about probably trans transhumanism, artificial intelligence, and perpetual life extinct, extension, <laughs> which seems to be the agenda here of the globalists like Bill Gates. I love that. They want life extension, but for a that, lowered population. Yeah, they want then, they do for themselves. Right. How, how does that work down the line? Yeah, well, <laughs> they want the, the rest. Of, and Harari says that they're, we're now producing useless people. So they have no value for human life. Well, a lot of them join the World Economic Forum. Yeah, they, they have no value. They don't believe in God. So there's no intrinsic value of existence. There's no intrinsic, in mo modernity, there's subjective reality. There's no intrinsic value to be alive. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. So, and we used to keep these people, these World Economic Forum lefty types around for a few laughs. Now it's getting a little too serious. Well, again, when they want to shut off your energy, they want to put you in 15 minute cities. They want to have you eat bugs. Uh, they, these are things that uh, destroy the quality of life for there, the middle class, for the average person. Right. And there were subjects of ridicule years ago. Anything similar to this were subjects of mass ridicule. Now they're today, being taken too seriously. Well, today they are the current uh, narrative of the mainstream media. And if you oppose this, you get censored. You know, you, you know, used to have free speech. We used to have a First Amendment. Nice. <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up for today. We've gone a little bit over time. Uh, in the end, God always wins. God is going to win here too. And uh, this insanity, Satan's going to be sent back into hell. And the gates are going to be locked again. I don't think God has created the human race to fail. But there is a remedy given to us, which we've got to take seriously, Second Chronicles 7.14, which is we need to get down on our knees and ask God to forgive us for letting the world get to this insanity. And uh, then what that Second Chronicles 7.14 says is God will hear our prayer and heal our land. And I believe that's where we're headed, but the judgment of God is going to be severe. Because as far as I can see, we're headed into World War III, a combination of World War III and a combination of energy crisis and a, com and a, and a world economic collapse. And uh, we've, I've been talking about this now. That's why I decided I'm not going to be in retirement. I'm going to do what I can to at least make people aware of this. I don't know if it can be prevented. The judgment of God at this point may be we just killed too many millions of babies after Roe v. Wade. We've taken God out of our schools starting in the 1940s and out of everywhere else by now. Uh, these are massive sins against God, and uh, they have consequences. In the end, God will win. Uh, this is Dr. Jerome Corsi. This is um, thetruthcentral.com. We're doing uh, podcasts every weekday. Pass the word. I'm more, much more active, especially right now on Twitter or X at Corsi Jerome 1. And uh, my Substack is just being built. It's uh, Jerome Corsi PhD dot Substack. Please take a look at it. There'll be much more material posted there uh, very shortly. Uh, today is um, Wednesday, January 3rd, 2024. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back tomorrow. God bless. <laughs>